Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanya, Professor Department Chair. Let me ask you a clinical question. Suppose I want to say that this patient sustained a fracture of his cervical vertebrae. How would you look at this vertebra and say that this is a cervical vertebra? In other words, what are the distinguishing features of a cervical vertebrae? This is one, there's another cervical vertebra, this is another cervical vertebra, this is yet another one, and another one. So let's take a look at a few distinguishing features of a typical cervical vertebra. We are talking about a typical cervical vertebra because there are atypical cervical vertebrae also, which I shall mention just a little while later. Straight away you can see this foramen here, this foramen here. This is what is called the transverse foramen. The transverse foramen, as the term implies, is situated in the transverse process. And this is the very important foramen because it gives passage to the vertebral artery, one on either side, which goes all the way up to the base of the skull, and then it enters the skull and supplies the, the posterior cerebral circulation. This is the most important and the most distinguishing feature of a cervical vertebra. And in any cervical vertebra, whether typical or atypical, the transverse foramen has to be present. And you can see that in all these, you can see this here. Just a few quick words about the transverse foramen. The transverse foramen, if you think of it as a rough rectangular in shape, though it is not exactly rectangular, but we will assume it's rectangular. Therefore, it should have four borders and they have four borders. We can see one border here. This is the pedicle. This is one border of the transverse foramen. This is the transverse element, which forms the transverse process. The transverse element is the embryonic remnant of the transverse process. This is the costal element, which is the remnant which would have formed the rib in the thoracic region. That's why it's called the costal element. And joining the transverse element and the costal element, we have this piece of bone here. This is the costal transverse bar which actually provides a bed for the spinal nerve to come out. So this, these are the four boundaries of the transverse foramen. The next important distinguishing feature about a cervical vertebra is are these elevations on either side of the superior surface of the body. They are referred to as the uncus or the uncinate process. Literally, it means hook-like process. That's the meaning of the word uncus. This uncus or the uncinate process is located on either side on the superior surface of the vertebral body and this is the one which articulates with the inferior aspect of the vertebral body above to form what is known as the uncovertebral joint. This is the only part of the joint between the vertebral bodies in the cervical region which is a synovial joint as opposed to the rest of the articulation which is a secondary cartilaginous joint formed by the intervertebral disc. In contrast, the uncovertebral joint is a synovial joint. That's the second important distinguishing feature about a cervical vertebrae. The other features which are also typical of a typical cervical vertebrae are this wide transverse in, uh, cervical spinal foramen, which gives passage to the spinal cord, and the deeply bifid spinous process. If you look very carefully, you'll find that all the spinous processes are bifid especially this is what distinguishes a cervical vertebra and I will show you the second cervical vertebrae that has got the most bifid spinous process. While we're talking about the cervical vertebrae, we must also mention a few features about the atypical cervical vertebrae. And what are the atypical cervical vertebrae? Let's go in the reverse order from below up. So let's remove this. And let's take a look at this one here. This is the first cervical vertebra, also called the atlas. Why is it called the atlas? Because this supports the skull, just like the mythical Greek god Atlas, who was banished from this earth and he was forced to carry the whole world on his shoulder. That's why this vertebra is called the atlas, because it holds the skull on the top of it, the skull being the earth. If you notice, before I proceed with the features of the atlas, you will notice that this is also called the transverse foramen on either side. But let's come back to the other features of the atlas. It does not have a body. Instead, it has got an anterior arch and an anterior tubercle 
a posterior arch and a posterior tubercle and it's got the articular facet for the occipital condyle. The occipital condyle of the occipital bone is the one which articulates here to form the atlanto occipital joint which gives us the nodding movement. This is the space which is occupied by essentially three structures. In front, this region is occupied by the dense of the axis, which I'm going to show you just a little while later. Then there's the transverse ligament of the atlas. And then we have the spinal cord. And this whole space constitutes what is known as the steel rule of thirds. This whole thing that you see is the lateral mass of the atlas. It can be divided into the following components. This medial portion, this elevation, this is the one which gives attachment to the transverse ligament of the atlas. Then it contains the articular facet for the occipital condyles, which I have already mentioned. And then it contains the transverse process itself with the transverse foramen. It, life, it is connected to the axis below and to the occipital bone above by means of the atlanto occipital and the atlanto -ox axial membranes, anterior and posterior, respectively. So these are the salient points about the atlas. One important clinical correlation pertaining to the atlas is when there is a compression force from the top, it can produce what is known as the Jefferson burst fracture. When the atlas fractures into four fragments, one fracture line goes across the anterior arch like this, another one goes across the anterior arch like this, a third fracture fragment arch fracture line goes across like this, and a fourth one goes like this, and therefore the atlas is fragmented into four pieces. Piece number one, piece number two, piece number three and piece number four. So these are the four pieces of the at Jefferson's burst fracture. The point to be remembered is that in Jefferson's burst fracture, the spinal cord is usually not compromised because the fracture fragments move outwards. Now let's take a look at the next atypical cervical vertebra. And I brought the axis in the view. How do we recognize the axis? This is a C2 cervical vertebra. We recognize it by means of this pro projection. This is the dense or the odontoid process of the axis. This is the reason why this bone is called the axis. This is the strongest cervical vertebra. And this axis is the one which articulates in the, with the anterior arch of the atlas to form what is known as the median atlanto axial joint. And it is held in place by the transverse ligament of the atlas, which I mentioned just a little while back, running across like this. So this is the dense or the odontoid process. And here you can see the articular superior articular facets, which articulates with the inferior articular facets of the atlas to form the lateral atlanto axial joint. And I will turn this around to show you the deeply bifid spinous process, as I told you earlier. So the axis has got a very deeply bifid spinous process. Another important clinical correlation pertaining to the atlas axis is what is known as the hangman's fracture, also called traumatic spondylolysis. What exactly is this hang hangman's fracture? In other words, how does a person die when you hang him by the neck? The fracture fragment goes just behind the transverse foramen. It goes between the superior articular facet and the inferior articular facet in this region where my probe is pointing and that region is called the pars interarticularis and a fracture on both the sides is what is known as traumatic spondylolysis and when such a fracture occurs the anterior piece of the fracture fragment which is already attached to the atlas above which in turn is attached to the occipital bone moves forward and the rest of the vertebral column moves backwards and the spinal cord is transected at the level of third spinal segment leading to respiratory arrest and death of the person. That is how hangman's fracture produces death. So this is, these are the salient points which I wanted to mention to you about the cervical vertebrae, the typical and the atypical. And before I conclude, I just want to bring your attention to another one aspect about another atypical cervical vertebra and that is shown here. The seventh cervical vertebra is also known as the vertebra prominence. Why is it called the vertebra prominence? Because its spinous process is very prominent and you can feel it at the back of your neck just before the thoracic vertebra. And that's the reason why this is called the vertebra prominence.
So these are some of the points about the cervical vertebrae. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. Have a nice day.